right, amen. 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 Thank you, choir. Uh, thank you, uh, Children's Music Ministry. Now, next week, we're going to have those that are 85 and above will be singing <laughs> those, those songs next to this. We have the Senior Saints Ministry, and uh, amen. But uh, like, like Brother George prayed, it's childlike faith. Amen. And it's just real sweet to see little girls sing a song and have a nice time and they love Jesus. Amen. If you'd be so kind, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. All right. And we're in our book study. We just started chapter 7, so we haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to need this verse. So we're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Excuse me, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And you say, where's Ecclesiastes? Well, the biggest book in the Bible is Psalms. After that is Proverbs. And after that is Ecclesiastes. Somewhere a little bit in the middle to the right of the it's Bible. 974. What's that? Page 974. 974 if you got a few Bibles. Amen. It's page 703 in my Bible. All right, amen. It is good to be saved. It's good to be in church. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We're going to look at one verse. Verse 9. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 9. Whosoever removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. And you say, well, that's kind of a strange verse. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm not even going to talk about the verse, to be honest with you. We're going to look at one word. It's the only time it's found in, in a King James Bible, and I needed the word, and that word is endangered. All right, so forget about the rest of that. <laughs> I just needed the springboard verse there, but we're going to look at the word endangered. Now, uh, by introduction, the word endangered means threatened with a danger. In danger, you know, danger there, and danger. Threatened with a danger, to expose to danger. <laughs> threatened with extinction. Synonyms include uh, threatened, jeopardized, uh, hazard, and risk. And I believe we live in an endangered world. And we live in an endangered society. And I'm going to try my best this morning and next week. This is a, a two-parter, so if you're here this week... You got to come next week to get the, you know, to get the second part there. I'm going to try to explain, you know, my thoughts here and what the Bible has to say about endangered. All right. Now this week we're going to look at God's endangered planet. All right. And then next week we're going to look at God's endangered people. So I've given you the the two parter right there. Now we're going to look at. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, all right? Then God started his six-day creation, and God then created man, and he created woman to take care of the earth, all right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, he said to them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful, and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the earth, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. All right, God also said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. All right, the idea of dress and keep it, you had to take care of it. All right, when God created Adam and Eve, it wasn't just, you know, sit under the palm tree and you know, hey, lion, fetch me a grape, and you know, it was, oh, uh, you know, antelope, you know, fan me. He said, you had to dress it, you had to keep it, you had to take care of it. In fact, I'm going to put you in charge of it, I want you to subdue it, have dominion over it, I want you to take care of it. All right? And God gave us humans the responsibility of taking care of the earth. Now, the Bible uses the word steward. All right? Now, God has made us stewards of the earth. Now, a steward means a foreman, manager, governor, administrator, or guardian. All right? And out of this, we get the doctrine of stewardship. All right? God wants us to be a foreman, a manager, a governor, an administrator, and a guardian in our lives. 
in our finances, in our tithes and offerings, in our possessions, in our families, in our bodies, and we're to be good stewards towards the earth and towards the environment and towards planet earth. All right? Being a steward, again, doesn't mean that we own the earth. It's God's earth. He owns the earth. And he has entrusted us to be good stewards. In fact, Psalms 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. We live in the earth, but it's God's earth. In fact, the earth is like a little footstool to him. He's up in heaven, and he can put his foot on the earth. But we're to be stewards. And the question I always pose is, are we good stewards? Now, I, it's easy to say yes or no. In fact, I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to start throwing out some, some Bible verses and some facts, and we're going to, you know, we're going to look at this. This is sort of a, uh, an environmental, be nice, you know, to the planet message here. Now, the question is, are we good stewards? Are we good uh, to the animals of planet Earth? All right, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10 says, A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. All right? You know, the beast could be your, your, your cow that's working in the field. Your beast could be your dog, your cat, the animal. You know, are you nice to your dog? You're nice to your cat. All right? Uh, I know a lot of people here in church, they love their pets. All right? And that's a good thing. All right? It's biblical. All right? But what happens? You know, there's a lot of animals in the world. And what do we do? We hunt them, we eat them, and we abuse animals. All right? You know, so there's a lot more out in the animal world than just our dog and cat. And people, again, usually love their pets. And I know in our church we have a bunch of pet lovers, and God likes that. But the sad part is that we also got shelters full of, you know, abused and neglected uh, pets. I'm on Facebook. I got some Facebook friends. It's like their mission in life is to get someone to adopt the dog. I get that. All right? We need to take care of our animals. God gives us stewardship over the animals. Now, we also, like I said before, we eat animals. That's a part of life. Now, if you're a vegetarian, that's okay, too. We're not, we're not going to have that little debate, you know. But anyway, but God does give us some stewardship when it comes to eating animals. In fact, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 22, Old Testament. It's around, I think around the third or fourth book in the Bible there. Okay. God does give us some stewardship and some Bible principles about, you know, eating animals and stuff. In fact, a lot of the Old Testament law has to do with that as well. But Deuteronomy chapter 22. This is a very familiar story. I'm sure most of you guys have heard this. But Deuteronomy chapter 22. Uh, look at with me, if you will, verse 6. Deuteronomy 22, verse 6, If a bird's nest chance to be before you in the way, in any tree or on the ground, whether there be young ones or eggs, or the dame sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dame with the young. But thou shalt in any wise let the dame go and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest prolong thy days. Isn't that interesting that there's a blessing Right at the end, God says if you see a bird's nest, whether it's in the tree, all right, whether it's, it's on, the, on the ground, some birds form their nests on the ground. I mean, I've seen some owls do that down in Florida. Or if the nest has fallen down and the mother's still there. All right, God's given some principles here. And he says that if you follow these principles, that you will prolong your days. I mean, God's going to give you some, some, an extra long life if you take care of his animals. Now... Some Jewish commentators, they say that this is the smallest or the least of all the Old Testament law and commandments. But yet we see the promise of a blessing for being obedient, that we would get a long life as a result of this. God says, you see, you see the nest and the mother and the baby birds and the eggs. He says, you can take the eggs. All right, but listen, we were at the dime last week, we had scrambled eggs. All right, you can eat the eggs. He says, if you see the baby birds, I, you take the baby birds. I mean, make, make bird pie or make bird stew. I mean, you know, <laughs> come on, listen, there's some cultures. You watch those, like, you know, uh, travel shows. I mean, they eat baby birds, all right? He's, God says you can eat them. 
when he says, don't take the mama bird. You say, why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, for the bird's sake. You know, the mother there just is going to lose all his babies and, and, and the eggs there, the loss of the young. God would not want total cruelty on all the, all, all the animal family there, partly for man's sake, to teach him a lesson not to be greedy and covetous, all right? But also to leave the mother alone so that the mother may, you know, six months or a few months down the road, make some more eggs and reproduce and reproduce itself so that we may eat and that the bird himself may uh, reproduce as well. And God says, because what would happen? What would man normally do? Take the eggs, take the babies, take the mother. That's greedy. Yeah, it's but God, that's right. But God says, you can just take them little eggs and make them little babies and you can make bird pie, bird stew, whatever, <laughs> you know. But to leave mom a bird alone and you're going you're gonna to get a blessing. All right? Yeah, very interesting. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the animals. Now, you guys know I say this on occasion. Uh, I watch the animal shows. In fact, it's something me and my wife like to do. And I want to talk about a couple of the different animals. We'll talk, number one, about the African elephant. All right? Around the 1500s, uh, all the scientists estimate that in Africa there were 26 million uh, uh, elephants on the continent at that time. Now, you know where this is going to go, <laughs> all right? In the late, teen, late 1800s, there was a mass production of combs piano keys, and pull cue balls, cue balls, and what are they made out of? Ivory. Now where does ivory come from? Tusks. It does? I thought they just dug it in the ground. No, it comes from elephants. All right? In the early 1900s, and we see the pictures of this, uh, shooting an elephant on a hunting trip was considered a, a sort of... Uh, a great honor. It showed that you had wealth. It showed that you had power. I mean, there you are, the little man with the mighty gun, and you just killed an elephant. And it was sport hunting. A lot of uh, Europeans and Americans. I, I think Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, you know, nice president, he was a hunter. All right? By 1913, uh, the U.S. is just, the United States alone is consuming 200 tons of ivory per year. The elephant population has dropped from 26 to 10 million. Fast forward, 1930, 5 million. 1969, 1.3 million. 1989, 600,000 elephants. 2012, the growth of the consumer middle class in China increases the demand for ivory, and the price reaches over $1,000 for a pound of ivory in Beijing. Low wages in Africa drive poachers to kill more elephants. Now let me just say this, besides the ivory, people eat elephant, <laughs> all right? Uh, not just the Chinese people, I mean, they eat that, but the local African you know, countries there, you go on the, uh, you know, go on the internet, internet and you punch up you know, elephant recipes and you're gonna see, you know, you see out there in Africa, the big old fire and the barbecue, and they throw the elephant there and they, they roast them, they barbecue them. Uh, what else do they do here? Um, they, oh, they, they make elephant soup, elephant porridge, and in the African culture, when they hunt and kill an elephant, the king gets the head, and he gets the right leg. That's his. And then it goes to who got the second spear in and the third spear, and it gets broken down that way. All right? Now, fast forward. A year later, 2013, this was a nice thing, and I give credit where credit is due. U.S. President Obama passes executive order combating wildlife trafficking to attack the ivory issue from a government approach. Fast forward today, it's estimated there's between 350, low estimate, to 500,000 elephants left. I mean, come on, I, I, that's, that's sad. We don't need ivory, we can make the plastic. I mean, I understand people gotta eat, and I'm not, and the funny part, let me just say this. <laughs> I am not a, like one of those like tree-hugging environmentalist wacko types that we all know these kind of people, all right? Uh, I, I want to be a good steward. I think God's people should be a good steward. We should be a little conscious uh, about his creation, all right? 
We also, we kill in the elephant. We also eat in the frogs. I mean, it's not an American thing so much. I mean, every once in a while down in Florida, you go to the buffet, you'll see, what's that? It's frog legs. But we eaten up to one billion frogs every year. You go to France, it's, it's part of the kid's school meal. All right, you know, they get the little, the little, what, a little piece of cheese, a little piece of ham, one or two frog legs, and that's their school lunch. All right, also, frogs are popular throughout uh, Europe and Asia, and also high-end restaurants throughout the world. Now, maybe some of you old-timers have heard of this, but how many remember the, the uh, passenger pigeon? The passenger pigeon, we ate the passenger pigeon to extinction. It was the most common bird in North America up until 200 years ago. Some reports flocks of these birds numbering in the billions, billions. Up to 25 billion of these birds were around. And what happened? You know, it tastes like chicken. It's, it's a lot of them around. And they started eating them. It was cheap food. It was fed to the poor people. Uh, Southerners would feed their slaves with it. And what happened? In 1896, a final flock of 250,000 were killed by a group of hunters who actually believed that they thought it was the last flock left and there's no more carrier pigeon, no more left. All right? The American buffalo or bison. I mean, how do you go to the diner and get a bison burger? That's kind of funny, but in, uh, in 1800, there were 80 million buffalo in North America. 80 years later, there were 750, not 1,000, 750. By 1900, there were 500. And what happened? Uh, the farmers and the herders and people got a little conscious minded and said, hey, we got to do something about that. And here's an example of man being a good steward through protection and brood breeding programs. By 2008, we've got 350,000, and today, roughly around a half a million. All right? You know, the city of Buffalo was named Buffalo not because of the chicken wings, but because the range of the buffalo extended from the west out to even western New York as well. All right? Not anymore. Today, there are less than 100 Florida panthers left in the wild, and they live in the Everglades and Big Cypress. Um, me and my wife actually had the privilege of uh, petting a, a Florida panther. They had a, a, uh, a guy that had that owned these privately and, and stuff, and, and uh, we got to go, we got a little picture, and, and I got to touch a lion and a panther, and, and you know, you say, well, shouldn't they be out in, out in the wild? Well, yes and no, we're gonna find out why, because of breeding programs and trying to keep the population from going extinct, all right? Uh, this was in the news. This is one of the most bizarre things. This was in the news last night. I think Friday night in Paris, France. They have a zoo. And would you believe <coughs> somebody went in and killed the rhinoceros and cut its horn off? You say, why? Because the horn is worth three times more than an ounce of gold because people in China use it for aphrodisiacs and they use the powder of the horn in France. I mean, that's like going to the Bronx Zoo at 2 o'clock in the morning and saying, oh, everyone's sleeping. That's horrible. Yeah, that's, how, that's right. right. This God's creation, all right? We hunt in the whales. We're running out of tuna. I mean, I like tuna sushi, and I like tuna fish, and I mean, a little grilled tuna, but we eat all of them. We're hunting some species of sharks to extinction. Now, I told you before, I like the animal shows. Uh, I don't recommend eating shark fin soup. I'm, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, what they do is they catch the shark, they cut the fin off, they throw the rest of the shark down and back into the ocean. He can't swim, he dies, and we're killing millions. So someone can have uh, shark fin soup. Uh, that's sad. And I can go on and on and on and how we eat and mistreating and abusing, and we're putting in, in danger God's creation, God's animals, all right? Now, I also believe that society is aware of this, all right? They're trying, that's a good thing. There's a lot of groups and associations and even governments that's really trying to be uh, good stewards. Now, anyone here of PETA? The People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals? Well, most of us belong 
to the other Peter. You know, there's two groups of Peter. People for the ethical treatment of animals, and then the other Peter is the People Eat and Taste the Animals Association. <laughs> come on, that's humor. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm, I'm try, uh, that's, all right, come on. That's what we do. We eat the animals. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's something that we do. Now, listen, I, I, I like meat, all right? But uh, you know the funny thing? It's not in the note. You ever watch those shows how they take the cows and the chickens and they starve them through their cages and enclose? By the time it gets to your plate, it's like, I don't think people want to eat that again. <laughs> All right? But, I know, I know. Listen, we, we eat animals. Listen, we eat every week. We eat every day. All right? I'm not putting a guilt trip. I am not a vegetarian, okay? I'm just, I am aware, and I wish that we could do some things. And that's what, and that's what I'm hoping to bring out in here in the message. All right? But what are some of the factors that cause, uh, it causes endangered species? All right? Number one, habitat destruction. This includes population. All right, we're growing. We're, we're, we are growing. Currently, there's 7.3 billion people. By 2050, they expect 11 billion people. Uh, you know, and what happens? As our population grows, we eat more animals and we threaten them and we take more land. Where it affects the agriculture. Why? Because as our population grows, we have to take more savanna, more rainforest, and other forests and cut them down to make new land. And when we cut down the savanna, the rainforest, and, and, the, and the other forests, we're, we're you know, getting rid of the animals also, because they live there. All right? Urbanization, you know, that used to be trees, now it's a Walmart that kind of thing, skyscrapers, all of this stuff. This affects uh, the animals. Even people who own animals affect the animals. You say what? People that own livestock, ranches, and that kind of thing, they eat the grass and the food that, and, and things that would normally be available for the, uh, the, the wild animals as, as well. We also have a problem with logging, cutting trees for firewood. Now, I like, you know, I like the fireplace that's kind of neat and everything, all right, but we've got to be careful of, even about the, the wood in the trees. China has an astounding... Uh, Excuse me, China uses 80 billion pairs of chopsticks every year to feed their 1.3 billion people. The country chops down 20 million mature trees annually to fuel the habit. And China's forest leaders have acknowledged that it will transition eventually to a different type of cutlery. So instead of chopsticks, they might start using forks or spoons. I'm not sure. Right? Um, my wife told me when she lived in Korea, the past president, like 20 or like 40 years ago, President Park, they would use the trees, make chopsticks, and then he was like looking at these bare mountains, and he said, that's not cool. And they started replanting the trees in forests, and that's a good thing. They say Christmas tree farmers here in the Northeast or Canada, when they pull out a tree, they usually plant another one. That, that's common sense. That's a good thing, all right? Mining, mining destroys the land and infects the animals as well. Me and my wife, we go to West Virginia every year to this little artsy town with some Roman baths, and it's all nice, but to get through the town, we actually drive through a mining town. And you see the half of a mountain removed, all the trees cut down, and it's a little dusty, windy, and, you know, I'm for mining. Listen, you get the coal, I understand that, but, you know, there's got to be a time and a place to kind of, you know, hopefully straighten it out, replant trees, and, you know, you just can't always just destroy, destroy, destroy. Finally, industrialization. Well, the factories, the pollution, it affects, it affects our water, it affects the river. You know, some of the old timers, you could say, uh, I used to go swimming down in this creek, or I used to go swimming in that river. You can't. They say Lake Ronkonkoma, like up until, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, was a little tour spot. They had, a, they had a, I think, a hotel there, and people would go swimming. The lake is, was clean. Now they say it's a toxic dump. I mean, you can't even put your toe there. It'll probably melt if you take it out. There's actually a movement to drain Lake Ronkonkoma and take the pollution out and either refill it with water again. And they don't trust people because people are dumping their stuff and, and just putting land in and refilling the thing. All right? So anyway, we, we've, got, we've got some problems. We know that. All right? we, also, we also are hunters. All right? Now, I'm, I, I am pro-Second Amendment, I believe in hunting, that's all good, but human beings are the only 
creature that hunt for pleasure. You know, if you're going to kill a deer, you eat it, that's fine. But you just don't, you know, run around and, you know, I'm going to kill this animal and put a trophy. Um, last year, remember there was a dentist, I think he was from Texas, yeah. he killed Cecil the lion. Yeah. And you know what, Cecil the lion, he was a lion, <laughs> I'm defending the lions, he was a, a human friendly lion. He was he used to being around humans, he wouldn't attack them, and he was on a protected nature preserve, and what they did was, no, there was no fence, just an imaginary border. And they lured him with a little stake or something across the line. And once he did, blam, he took a picture. And I mean, this guy was like public enemy number one. Now, this is the things that people did hundreds of years ago. I, I think, you know, you want to hunt, you want to eat your food, that's fine. But be a little careful about just killing for a trophy. I mean, go play video games, I guess, <laughs> you know, something. But, all right, hunting. We're polluters as well, like I just mentioned. Also, the introduction of exotic or invade, invasive species. You say, well, what's that? People, as they travel, they sneak animals, they sneak plants in. And I don't know, like, listen, bamboo was not natural to, uh, you know, Long Island. I bought a plant, I, I took actually a bamboo plant from my customer. That took me five years to get rid of that stuff. Yeah. That stuff is rampant. Florida's got a big snake problem. Why? People, they, people have brought in their pet little baby anacondas and boas, and what happens, <laughs> they grow to 15 feet long and 20 feet long. You see the YouTube videos, and the, there's the snake. It's, it's e eating an alligator. And what happens is, not only the alligators, they eat raccoons, they eat the natural wildlife. So invasive species are, are hurting that as well. Now scientists estimate there are over two-thirds of the animals and plants that once lived on the earth are gone. Humans absorb 42% of the earth's land, productivity 30% of its marine net, and 50% of its fresh water. 40% of the planet land is devoted for human food pr uh, production, and 50% of the planet's land mass has been transformed for human use. This is going to happen as we, as we grow in population, but God wants us to be good stewards. There has to be a balance in this. And again, all of these things that happen affect the water pollution, right? it affects the air pollution. Now, this is kind of a controversial topic, and I'll just make minimal comment. People talk about global warming. All right, They think that all the pollution may lead to this. It's a big thing in the political debate. Um, you know, it's kind of weird. I don't think it should be a political issue. I think it's something that we should look at and, and really study. Uh, is the pollution that we're doing, is it causing? Like I said, two weeks ago, it was 70 degrees <laughs> in February. And here it is, March, where it's the, my wife was like, oh, the flowers came up. Now they, now they did. <laughs> All right? I mean, is this, is this global warming? We have to look at things like our carbon footprint and greenhouse gases and you know, all the pollution that, that we and, and other countries, other countries, believe, believe me, this is not a guilt trip on us. There are some countries that are really bad. I mean, I've gone to some countries where they, they the muffler is like the old style, <laughs> you know, just spitting out the gas, no catalytic converter, you know, leaded gas, I mean, pollution, pollution, pollution. All right? Now, only humans, all right, God's, God's you know, God put us here to be good stewards here for the planet. And I believe that we can make some positive changes here for our, our animal friends here in the environment, all right? And here are just a few ways that we can give back, all right? Being good stewards. Remember, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. All right, what are some things that we could do? We could support, listen, I, let me just say this first. I believe in the church, you know, God should get his tithes and offerings, but it's okay to support some animal groups. You know, that's okay. Captive breeding. Uh, and release endangered animals. Endangered animals are captured and are then bred to ensure. See, what happens is when you watch the animal shows, the baby, the mama cheetah will have like five kittens. And what happens? Survival of the fittest, normally only two live. The, uh, the hyenas eat them, the other ones, you know, uh, you know, other ones fight for the milk. But in a captive breeding program, you can get the maximum five kittens and raise all five up. And then you can contact another zoo have them bred, and next thing you know, within a 10, 20 years, you can have a thousand of these animals. So, you know, those kind of programs, that's man being a good uh, steward. 
and getting rid of the exotic invasive species, get rid of the bamboo and the, and the big snakes, all right? There should be a protection for native species, right? In Florida, the big thing in, in South Florida is the manatee. Now, me and my wife, we've, we've, we've swam in a river, we've got the pet of manatee, we've seen them in the natural, and then what happens? You know, five minutes later, there goes a boat with the propeller and it hits the manatee and they die. You know, there's, and there's not, a, they, they don't make a lot of babies and, and they're under threat. The Indian tiger, the panda, all these different animals, we're losing them, all right? Other ways is humans can control the wildfires. Wildfires happen naturally or, or man-made and if man can stay on top of the fire, fire these fires, control them. Uh, they'll save more land and they'll save more animals. All right. We can also do things like permaculture. You say, I, didn't, I didn't even know what that meant, so I'll tell you. Permaculture is teaches us how to uh, use natural resources. We kind of do this here in New York. It's been very popular the last 10 years. Those solar panels on houses and stuff, right? that saves coal and oil being burnt you know, from the electrical plants. All right, growing your own vegetable garden, that's a good thing. My wife actually saw this and I'm interested in doing it. Saving your rainwater to like a big old 55 gallon drum. They sell a thing with a little hose attachment instead of wasting and paying New York water, you can have the water drain into a water thing and you can water your plants that way. Ah, that's a good idea, I don't know. I think so. We can be involved in supporting the waterways and oceans. I watched the, uh, one of these uh, YouTube videos where a guy invented this machine, he floats it out in the Pacific Ocean, and it's a filter, and within like eight hours, he collects like 10,000 plastic bags, and it the ocean water gets filthy, because you've also seen the videos where what happens, the sea turtle comes along, he eats the plastic bag, he gets stuck, and they gotta pull it out, and, you know, I'm for, uh, I'm for those kind of technology, and filtering the machines and stuff, all right, finding renewable energy sources, like I said, uh, not just the solar panels. Anybody see like those big gigantic windmill things? All right, they're like wind towers, yeah. yeah. You know, that stuff, Long Island has, a, has an ocean, it has a current, and they want to put them, I think, five or 10 miles off, and some like rich people on the South Shore said, no, we don't want that. Well, what's wrong with a little wind power? <laughs> All right, so, you, so what you see, a wind turbine. You know, you can, you can save a lot of money. You can be a good steward. Instead of burning oil, burning coal, using nuclear power, you put a wind thing up, the ocean current turns it, the wind turns it, you get free electricity through the turbine. All right, yeah, look little, little things here. Develop local food sources. If people bought their food locally, instead of always having it shipped and mailed and, you know, all this, go to the local food market that's grown locally, all right? Again, using technology to reduce uh, uh, pollution, uh, such as uh, filters and water pur uh, purification systems. All right? That all sounds nice. Now we can, how, how can we bring this a little more personal? How can I be a better uh, steward? All right? Here's some water, electricity, uh, gas conservation uh, tips. I carpooling. We've been talking about that for 30, 40 years. If you know your friend's going to the store and you want to meet them there, instead of both of you driving two cars, you take one car. You save, you save, the, you save the gas. Make it a group affair. All right? Uh, take advantage of the sunshine and save electricity. You don't really see this often, but most people don't hang their clothes on the line anymore. I don't, you know... <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure my neighbor doesn't want to see Henry's underwear that's flying out the side window, but you know what, the, you know, you get the LIPA bill for the electricity, and I, you know what, maybe we'll do that. My mom used to, used to have those things, and you poke it in, you can hang them all in, and you got the line at the tree, and you know, I, I just got uh, Fruit of the Loom, I mean, standard. <laughs> not, I, I don't got the Speedos, and the, you know, I, it's just, I'm just a regular old pair, all right? Nothing to offend. I, now my neighbor's on the other phone looking at her. So flying out the window. I, size uh, 60 pink, you know? <laughs> yeah, she's a big one. Uh, all right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right, anyway. Listen, little things like that. You know, you, it, it's funny. You save it here, you save there. 50 bucks a month ends up being five, $600 a year. All right? You can support positive change. Don't protest. All right? Participate. Recycle, reduce, and reuse. 
my wife, she's a big recycler. I mean, me, I, I kind of get it, you know, and everything. I'm one of these guys, one of you know, chili contests. I'm taking my can of chili and I, I throw it in the bag. She, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. No, you can't throw the can out. And then she washes the can. I, I said, what? Why are you washing the can? No, the town, the town says they, you can't have dirt. We have to recycle this can the clean way so it's done properly. I'm like, okay, sorry, no problem. We're gonna, we're gonna reach. He's good at that. In my garage, she's got the bag. She takes all the water bottles and she saves them in a big bag and she does that. Now it's funny. My parents down in Florida, they don't have a recycling program. Everything just goes in the garbage, I, and you don't feel guilty. I, for my parents' house, I'm like, Dad, you don't even recycle like, a bottle? Okay, nah, we voted against that. We don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> but uh, I am for recycling. They say you can do a lot of things with those plastic bags. You shred the plastic. You can use the plastic for other things, and you know, it saves the land. You know, listen, all of us that live here in Long Island, like in, in uh, Merrick and in Oceanside, you got those big, gigantic dumps, and what have they done? They've converted them into parks. I almost died at the Oceanside Dump. I, I tell you a story. My grandfather had a big old Suburban. He wanted to dump some stuff, and uh, I took a ride with him. And you know how the guy tells you to back up? Well, he backed up. He almost backed over the hill. <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, and there's, <clears throat> hold on, Henry. <clears throat> Pop pops be okay. He's like, da, 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 da. and he, he he stepped on the gas, and we kind of got back on on the on the on the ground there. But nowadays we recycle, we 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 try to reuse the, the metals, the plastic. We're good stewards, all right. We can we recycle. We can learn about our endangered species in our area. We can help to protect them. Join these little programs and stuff. Make your home wildlife friendly. Now, I'm not saying, you know, leave out three steaks for the bear to come over, okay? We don't want, no, we, we don't want that, all right? But, you know, you can buy, me and my wife, you get the little bird nest, I mean, I mean, the bird feeder, the water feeder. You can buy things to attract, like, hummingbirds and, and native things, and that's, and that's kind of, like, cool. You can do that, all right? You can put a sticker, if you want a big glass door, you put a sticker on your glass door, you say, why? Millions of birds die each year because they fly into that glass. Listen, <laughs> I've walked in, <laughs> millions of humans have walked into the glass thinking that you're going outside. It's like, oh, that's the door, what's that doing here? You know? But put in the sticker there, you can help the little birdie poos there. All right? You can plant, we all like own homes and we want to do planting. You plant native plants, all right, that attract things like bees and hummingbirds and butterflies that also pollinate our, uh, our flowers. All right, now this one I have to be a little sensitive, but you know, it says here, herbicides and pesticides. Now I'm in the landscaping business. I don't use the pesticide, but I use fertilizer. It's a money maker, but it always makes you rethink about, you know, the one looks nice, but there you are, you know, spreading the stuff and touching it, and I probably eat it every week anyway, but also, Slow down when you're driving. You say, why? When you see little Rocky Raccoon over there, you bear and roadkill. Slow down, save the animals, all right? We have to be, hey, you, running over a raccoon is one thing, but anyone ever run their car into a deer or a big animal, the car usually gets, uh, gets, uh, gets pretty smashed up. All right, be a good steward, all right? Another thing, I get this, when you're, like, when you're a tourist and stuff, don't buy things, you know, don't buy the tiger, you know, oh, this was a real tiger skin, or this with furniture was made from the wood in the rainforest, and, you know, uh, don't buy the crocodile, you know, stuff, and all these things, and you know, people love buying these kind of things, but if it's coming from an endangered species, we don't need that in our lives. Recycle your cell phones, all right, according to the manufacturers, some of those inner uh, minerals actually come from mines in Africa that's right near all the gorilla populations and stuff. All right? Don't harass wildlife. All right? Kind of just leave them alone. Protect the wildlife, right, as best you can. We, well, we don't want them endangered. We want to be good stewards. All right? Now, some might be thinking, Pastor Hank, why are you giving this big sermon on this? Well, for a few reasons, um. I'm gonna ask Evelyn if you can maybe just you know jump on the piano. I'm gonna we're gonna you know wind it down here. We're almost done, and we're gonna.
give a little invitation at the end, but you know, why are you giving this sermon, Pastor? Well, I said, I wanted to focus on endangered. And this week we're focused on, on God's endangered creation. And next week we're going to look at God's endangered people. I mean, we're important too. And we're going to look at what we've done to each other. But I'm just going to give you a, fr a few reasons why I gave you kind of a, an environmentally friendly kind of sermon. You can play any time on that one. But number one, remember, it's God's earth. He created and he owns it. Number two, when God created everything, he loved his creation and he said it was very good. And when God says something was very good, we ought to pay attention. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening or the morning, and the, or the sixth day. It's God's earth, and he wants us, his children, to be better stewards in his creation. That's today's message. Number four, God has an ongoing relationship with his creation. He didn't take a step back. He's entrusted us, but he wants us to be involved, and he's involved as well. Right, number five, creation has a relationship with God. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 32, let the sea roar, let the fullness thereof, let the fields rejoice, and all that is therein, and there shall be trees of the woods sing out the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. It's even God's creation has a relationship with God. Right, we don't live on a dead earth. Number six, caring for creation and caring for the poor. They are interconnected and go hand in hand. Remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at Leviticus chapter 19, and it was the story of the farmer. And what did he have to do? He had to leave the corners, and anything that fell down, he, he could not farm them. He left them for the poor people so that they may work and pick up the food. So this stuff is, is really connected. I, number seven, this is important. God will judge those that have destroyed his earth. Revelation chapter eight, uh, excuse me, uh, 11, verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroyed the earth. A lot of polluters. I'm going to make some money. No one's watching me dumping this. God's watching. You destroy his earth. He's going he's gonna to catch you. Number eight. Jesus is the almighty creator. And Jesus is the reason why we're good stewards. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning. All things were made by him. Jesus is the creator. He made everything. And without him was not anything made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. We get the light of Jesus Christ. We see that he created everything. And we just want to help keep his creation nice and clean and beautiful and, and healthy. Amen. Amen. And some might be saying, well, Pastor Hank, if I recycle my chili cans, and I plant the bird feeder, and I'm nice to the alligators, and when I see Rocky the raccoon on the side of the road, I, I don't run him over, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I give ten bucks to the Clean the River Society, I mean, I'm, I'm a good steward, and I get to go to heaven? It doesn't work that way. I, 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 I hate to report that, all right? God wants us to be good stewards, but in order to get to heaven, you must love and accept His Son, the Lord Jesus. Christ as your personal Savior. You need to be born again. Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 3, verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, if I'm good to nature, I get to go to heaven. No, no, no. To get to heaven, you got to go to Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So being nice to nature is good. Believe me, it's a good thing. But if you want to make it the eternal life in heaven, you got to go through Jesus. Yeah, come on, I, I gave 10 bucks. I, I, I didn't hit the right corner. My good works will save me, right? No, Ephesians chapter 
2, verse 8, 9. It's your faith in Jesus Christ, and God's grace will save you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? Don't boast when you're doing any work for the Lord. Don't expect him to save you. Just put simple faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll save you. Say, well, what do I got to do? I don't want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. Well, admit that you're a sinner. We're all sinners. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you tell God that I want to change from my sinful life. And I want to repent. I want to get right with God. Jesus said in Luke 13, 5, I tell you, nay, except a man repent, he shall all likewise perish. And you need to believe that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and rose again from the dead. Romans 10, 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt alive, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And through prayer, invite the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a simple verse. You want to be saved? I'm, you want to be a whosoever? We all whosoever. But I want to be saved. I call upon the name of the Lord. And he'll save you. And when he saves you, then go out and be a good steward and, you know, take care of the kitties and the raccoons and the alligators and recycle and do all those good things. And when you become born again, you yourself become a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold! All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And if you become born again Christian, accept the Lord, you can let me know. We'll, we'll praise the Lord. We'll shout. All right? Next week, we're going to look at God's endangered people. So hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Now let's go eat a bunch of chickens and cows and I know, not over the place. <laughs> we haven't fasted <passed> today. <laughs> but uh, let's be good stewards. Many an animal have been uh, sacrificed in the church. <laughs> Amen. Ah, okay.